Hey, welcome to our 10th weekly webinar on uh, COVID-19, organized by One Health Bangladesh in collaboration with Global Health Development. As you all know, our today's topic is One Health Capacity Building to tackle uh, pandemics. We have very three distinguished speakers to speak on this topic. First of all, I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Joanna McKenzie, and uh, she is a senior lecturer in One Health Epidemiology and International uh, Development, uh, MEP Lab School of Veterinary Science, Massey University, New Zealand. She is very much known to our Bangladesh One Health colleagues. She was engaged in a One Health Fellowship program. Uh, in Bangladesh and South Asian countries. Welcome, uh, Joanna, to our webinar. We have second speaker, uh, Mr. Robert Salarno. Uh, he is the director of Global Health Security at DI Global Health. He has a direct experience in working in Bangladesh with the implementation of uh, preparedness and response plan. Uh, during when our One Health Secretary has was established. And he's still very active in Bangladesh in implementation of uh, One Health, another One Health approach, planning fund, antimicrobial resistance, country grant to Bangladesh. And uh, welcome uh, Rob to our semi uh, webinar. And the third one is our uh, Dr. Selimud Jaman, who is the General Secretary of One Health Bangladesh. You all know him. And uh, he is the scientific officer uh, Institute of Epidemiology and Disease Control. He is directly involved with the implementation of field epidemiology training program of IDCR. And he's engaged with a lot of other One Health activities in Bangladesh and also you now with One Health Bangladesh as well as One Health. Secretariat. Uh, we welcome all these, these speakers uh, to our webinar. Before I ask them to go for presentation, I just uh, give some housekeeping announcement. As you all know, this is a webinar which will be recorded and uploaded in our One Health Bangladesh uh, web website. Uh, the participants can uh, put their question in question and answer Q and A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. It will be a session of nearly one, uh, one, one and 30 minutes. And during that time, presentations and question and answer together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with these few words, we'll go for our first presentation. And the first presentation will be made by uh, Joanna McKenzie. Do, can you please go ahead with your presentation, please? Thank you, Professor Natish. I'll just share my screen. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak uh, to today. And uh, good morning, everybody. Shubho Shakal. Thank you very much for uh, getting up early and um, accommodating particularly the time zone in New Zealand. Uh, so it's uh, three in the afternoon for us now. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to, um, to, to talk about our experience with One Health Capacity Building, uh, but bringing it into the context of uh, tackling pandemics. So it's, uh, I know many of you who are um, participating today have, um, have had direct experience with uh, Massey's One Health Capacity Building and uh, um, and some of the experiences that we've had out of this and, um, uh, and looking at how we could build on those to be better prepared for um, pandemics. So um, here's a few, I should have clicked earlier. So here's a, so we, we've, over the last 10 years, we've been running um, One Health Capacity Building programs in, in South Asia and uh, China and Mongolia. Um, and I'm sure a number of you whose lovely photos I'm looking at are um, listening today and uh, greetings to you also from uh, Peter Jolly and Roger Morris. Uh, so 
what I want to cover is really thinking about how can we be better prepared for next time? I mean, COVID-19 has taken a grip on us. Uh, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from uh, that pandemic and uh, also learning from um, the capacity building programs that we've been implementing. So I think um, one of the key things when it's coming to uh, to doing a better job, I guess, of managing pandemics is, is speed <clears throat> and really getting on to um, having systems in place that, uh, that, that any spillover event can be detected early, uh, investigated quickly, and a response put in place uh, quickly to try and prevent the disastrous situation that we've got now with, with COVID-19. So I'm going to talk about a few of these, these three things, um, sort of key factors of those, and then relate uh, how can we build one health capacity to uh, implement these. So looking first at um, detection, I mean, uh, you know, the surveillance, how can we detect when there's a new disease? And there's already been a huge amount of effort gone into this um, in, in last years, previous years, and, um, and a lot of systems have been put in place. And this is probably the area that I get think has progressed the most. Um, and, and key things are that um, frontline people are aware of, uh, they're aware of, of uh, picking up differences that it's easy to report and there's trusted systems uh, in place. Trust that um, that they will be they can report without repercussions, and also trust that it will be responded to. Uh, secondly, the investigation, the outbreak invest investigation stage, uh, you know, collecting really good data uh, early on in the outbreak, and having people who are skilled in collecting this data to get to um, find as many cases as possible. To, to get good data on those cases so that um, can understand uh, how this disease is spreading, um, how bad is it, and as much as possible collect information that uh, might give some idea of the source. Because really this, in the very early stages, is really about the only time that uh, is a window to collect data from cases that might give some indication of the source. Because once the uh, pandemic epidemic has taken hold. Everybody's so busy caught up with managing it that um, um, really having time to put into finding information about the source is uh, it, it's a lost opportunity. So it's um, so early investigations. Again, um, this is an area that there's been a lot of training uh, that's gone into, and people have. Um, quite well, uh, well, good skills in this, but I think there's also, the, here there's a potential for much more in the One Health approach. Oops, sorry, I've just clicked the wrong button. Oops, let me go back. Um, now on the response side, uh, this, this is a challenging area. Um, and as we've seen with COVID and with many previous outbreaks, actually, it's very difficult to get um, a quick response from a government. Um, you know, government uh, politicians are, are generally are, are very wary about, uh, you know, pushing the button and, and, and responding um, with strict measures because of uh, issues around creating public panic. Um, not wanting to cause the public to um, to be thinking negatively towards the government, and often what happens is that this this is delayed and delayed and delayed until there's uh, it's it, there's so much disease that you know the government doesn't have any choice but to respond, um, and by that stage it becomes very difficult to actually um, put in place an effective response. So thinking about how how we might be able to work with um, in this capacity building with um, the expertise, but also with the decision makers. I, do, um, I guess the wild card amongst a lot of this is the politicians, and it's we can we can control what we can control, and 
try and build good relationships with politicians also so that um, uh, we can, politicians will lead the responses that are going to have the best outcome. Oh, sorry, I keep pushing the escape button. Let's keep my sit on my head. Uh, so let's look at how we can achieve this. I think um, thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, organizationally, what could be put in place. Um, uh, structurally, so I, I feel that, you know, and if we're thinking about peacetime here and what can we have in place to try and um, get a better outcome next time, because there will be more spillover events as we all uh, are very clear on. I feel that it's really important uh, and well, it's very useful to have a, like a national One Health expert team um, that's, that's made up of human health, animal health and wildlife health, um, eco ecological people that's embedded in the government, that um, has the expertise in surveillance, in, um, uh, in, in outbreak and investigation and in response. So that the, this team uh, expertise is built up, uh, relationships are built up so that reporting can um, be come into this team and they can respond accordingly. Um, and that there's the relationships built also with the, the government and the, and the uh, decision makers. I guess if you want a sports analogy, this might be a dream team or a military analogy like the SWAT team, the specialized uh, weapons and tactics team. And this is their full-time job, um, which is, is um, preparing and, and monitoring the situation and investigating and responding as necessary. So what sort of skills and uh, expertise and, um, would this team have? And this is where we come into the One Health uh, capacity building. And, you know, what's the technical expertise? Um, so it's important, um, I, I think, included to surveillance, uh, outbreak response and, and investigation response is also risk analysis. Um, that the team is um, understands risk and how to analyze you know um, where risks are what what are the potential uh, risks of emerging diseases what um, uh, what areas or what risk factors there might be that can then help to target things like surveillance um, and and building communications so building skills um, in these areas and then um, And key components in this sort of capacity building would be around, and a lot of you will recognize these from uh, the Massey programs. I think we can um, learn even more from these, but combining the, the theory, the education and the action. Now this might be um, through formal education because uh, people do appreciate and are motivated by getting a degree. Um, there's pluses and minuses of that in terms of, of time that might be taken and then also um, uh, with a, a yeah so degree but but in particular combining that with the um, action or the field application component so um, combining this with like ongoing mentored activities so that there's relationships with uh, external global mentors to um, undertake like risk analyses for emerging diseases you know, looking at things like where um, uh, areas where there's deforestation or build up of uh, intensive livestock, you know, looking at the risk factors, um, implementing investigations uh, as outbreaks uh, occur, preparing response plans. And um, I think one of the tools out of the uh, Massey program that we found really worked really well was the scenario based um, outbreak investigations based on a scenario of a disease that emerged from wildlife into people and animals um, that was an unknown disease and so it involved all the sectors to work together to investigate um, and using this as a way also of engaging with the senior decision makers. I think this is a particularly effective tool where you have your um, the technical people who are doing the on the ground work and, and getting the data on the outbreak and then part of the scenario is in relating and bringing in the senior decision makers 
uh, going through the experience of relating the scenario to the senior decision makers um, and then uh, the decision makers themselves working through things like international notification or regional notifications, how they should respond, you know, what, what are the priority activities. So the, this, I think, is a particularly effective um, tool in the capacity building. Also training teams together so that can have a network of uh, regionally connected national um, expert teams. So building up the skills is really uh, a half, a third of the, uh, of the equation. And something that I've uh, learned and come to learn over time is that without building relationships and trust, these skills, um, they're not effective. I mean, uh, it, it's important to have people with skills, but it's also really important to, to implement the capacity building in a way that builds relationships and um, builds relationships within the team and and we all know that you know having one health teams function effectively is not all that straightforward and requires a lot of ongoing input and facilit facilitation so um, components around building the team building relationships and trust uh, within the government so between the team the the experts the disease experts uh, and their decision makers and the senior and the ministers. Um, then building relationships uh, in the country and in the region and globally. So I'll go into these um, uh, each individually. So thinking about national relationships. So we've got the team relationships. Um, but what are the relationships, what are the important relationships within the country? Uh, thinking about the upward relationships with the senior government decision makers. Um, th through both of our programs, through the scenario um, based, based exercise in the, with the large program where we had the big um, scenario in Bhutan. But also with the in the second program where we involved um, the brought in the senior decision makers uh, with the policy evaluation, that creating exercises and um, opportunities to bring the the experts and the government uh, senior government decision makers together is really valuable in that the senior people get to know what their experts um, have been trained in and what they're doing and helps them to first of all be aware of what expertise is available to them. Um, and, and also to uh, understand the level of that expertise and to know the people that who they can go to and vice versa. Um, then thinking about building outwards from the team, the relationships that are really important. And one of the problems with having a national level sort of expert team is that um, often it runs the risk of becoming quite remote and um, sort of based in the capital city, the head office and uh, out of touch with the the rest of the country and uh, it's so it's really important that that team that there's a part of the way that the team operates is that they build relationships with the frontline uh, people who will be detecting uh, unusual diseases or unusual um, uh, syndromes you know the clinicians the veterinarians but also with the communities and and the traditional healers uh, I just I think that it's very important that these relationships are in place uh, before outbreaks happen. I mean, we saw with Ebola that uh, there was a lot of distrust amongst the communities towards the disease control measures that were being put in place around funeral, uh, changing funeral um, patterns and so on. So I think it's important that the way that the teams operate is building these relationships. and. Um, in, in large, very large countries, you know, India, the US, um, you, you might want to have a tiered system where there are state teams uh, to, to try and um, be more, to, so that they can be closer to their communities um, as well as operating at a, at, a, at, at a high level. A thing about the, the regional relationships, um, Given that these diseases don't know boundaries, and not all, and you're you're in a situation very unlike New Zealand, where we're surrounded by the sea, 
um, that it's important of training regional teams together. And you know, we've seen the relationships that have been built through the uh, One Health program in Massey um, between uh, fellows in the different countries. And those relationships are incredibly important when it comes to disease outbreaks. If, if you know somebody, it's very easy to get on the phone um, or the email and make contact. But also before outbreaks and sharing information on surveillance. Uh, that, that's a key thing is, um, and you know, there's efforts to put in place um, South Asia um, disease surveillance system. And if that can be based around teams who know each other, that, that helps a lot in sharing the information. Again, scenario-based training that brings in the regional components so that people are brought together, they practice, they run through how things would be done, they identify what are the challenges and they think about ways it might be um, that it could address those. Uh, again, also involving the expert teams and their senior decision makers in each country in the regional activity so that uh, bringing in components like when if a country finds um, a, a disease that's got worrying, um, lo that looks serious, at what stage should they tell their neighbours and alert? And you know, these are all issues that came up with, with COVID. Um, so running scenario-based uh, activities where uh, people and senior decision makers have to make decisions about when to notify, how to notify, you know, what to notify. These are all important things that would make it easier uh, in the real event. Um, and this, uh, so this can be done through scenario training, through, um, through operational work by sharing surveillance, uh, and then also conducting, say, multi-country investigations so that people are, are working together uh, to gather information, maybe on looking at what's the risk of um, Crimean Congo, hemorrhagic fever, um, um, Nipah, you know, other, uh, uh, or looking at illegal trade or, you know, other issues so that they're doing investigations together, uh, getting information and at the same time building relationships. So at the global level, um, also it's important for the team to be linked globally um, with global experts. So we're I'm really thinking of sort of like the, an, an A team that, that can link between countries, but also is linked globally with the experts. Uh, that can occur through the capacity building program, through ongoing um, projects, uh, that the team can participate in international meetings and conference. Um, things like risk assessment, you know, I think um, under, understanding globally what's, what's known about uh, what are the pathogens in wildlife or the, not necessarily if they're pathogens, but the viruses and so on that are in, in wildlife. Uh, what, what, what's known about uh, risks, um, illegal trade, so that part of the responsibility of this team is kind of like monitoring the environment, the international situation, understanding what is known in terms of um, that they could apply to their country, but also what's risks of coming into the country. Uh, so very connected. Um, and also having these relationships with global people to conduct uh, research um, in, within their own country within the country that the team's been built in. Okay, so um, that's uh, a, a quick run through of my um, thoughts on, on how to set up um, a response, uh, how to try and preempt, or how to respond better next time, um, and how to build capacity for that in a One Health context. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Joanna, I think it was an excellent presentation and sharing quite important information for our colleagues. And we'll go to now to the second presentation. And as I introduced you earlier, uh, uh, we have another distinguished speaker from USA, uh, Mr. Robert Salonio. And I will ask him, Robert, can you please go ahead with your presentation, please?
Can you guys hear me okay and see the screen? I can see that from that. Okay, great. Thank you, Nitish, for that uh, very nice welcome. And thank you everyone for the opportunity to present today. I'm gonna to talk about One Health Preparedness and Response Planning in the context of my last work on the USAID-funded Preparedness and Response Project. So I will ground my experience and examples from, from that work. Um, some of you may know, of course, um, PNR, we were working actively in Bangladesh and supported um, the, the One Health Bangladesh uh, National One Health Coordinating Body. PNR's work was really spread across 16 countries and really to support the formation or strengthening of these national One Health platforms or multi-sectoral coordination mechanisms. And we did this across West Africa, Central, Eastern Africa, um, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And one of the other objectives was also around initiating and supporting uh, the development and, and testing of national preparedness and response plans. With 16 countries across a very diverse um, uh, portfolio, we really needed something to ground our work and figure out how we could all work from a similar kind of framework. And so this is a, a bit of a, a busy slide, if you will, but it shows that this was sort of the roadmap to how we got to building national One Health platforms and supporting preparedness and response plans. And really it was, it was about institutionalizing processes and the, the sensitization of the, the value that One Health brings to multi-stakeholder coordination. Because we had 16 countries, it, it provided us an opportunity to you know, capture all these lessons learned across the, the, across the 16 countries and understand sort of what the differences and nuances were across, um, across One Health more broadly. And what we realized is that you know, it's, it's more than what we think. You know, coordination, multi-sectoral coordination takes time and it, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and it's, it's an opportunity to collaborate at the international level, um, but really top down and bottom up. And this graphic here is, was adapted by a WHO graphic and it shows the five sort of key elements that we discovered across our 16 countries. In order to, to solidify and institutionalize One Health, we found that one of the key drivers is really political commitment. And I think we've seen in, in Bangladesh, the strong you know, political will that we have in, in your country to really you know, in, in institutionalize the, the process. Um, institutional structure is important too. You know, whether you are um, uh, uh, just a small, um, say, um, uh, informal group that's met uh, and that's meeting in academia, or you are actually, you know, embedded in the prime minister's office and have, have a mandate to support the emergency operations center, having a structure with clear accountability and roles and responsibilities really helps bring value to, to the collaboration. There's also the need for really coordination. I mean, I think we think that um, coordination is something that happens um, you know, easily, but you, you really have to practice at it and re it requires, you know, really strong, strong management capacities. And the same around, and John, I mentioned this, joint planning and implementation. It really helps to, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in my presentation, it talks, it, it really helps to bring multiple sectors together during the planning process and during implementation, finding those activities, the joint risk assessment, finding ways to bring together um, all of the different bodies that are working in the, in the platform. And then, of course, having the right technical and financial resources. Um, Bangladesh is one of the countries that, um, in our 16 countries we worked, it was one of the only countries that had a, a designated line item in their budget for One Health Bangladesh to support this multi-sectoral -sector coordination. So really a huge achievement, but also critical to getting, you know, that showing that and demonstrating that political will. It's also important to see collaboration happen horizontally across sectors and vertically um, from the district and subnational level up to the national, regional, and international levels. Well, when we talk about One Health collaboration in, in the, the, the context of uh, pandemic preparedness, it's really important to ground it in some of the timeliness metrics around outbreak response, right? And what we're trying to do, of course, is limit the time between these different intervals and milestones in this, in this um, metric. And this was developed by Ending Pandemics and Mark Similinski through a consultative process. And I, I really like it because I think it, it gives a better way or a nice way to measure these different key um, attributes, but what can you do then to shorten the time to detection, verification, and intervention? 
I think, and, and Joanna really talked nicely about this and our, our, our presentations align uh, pretty closely. Um, I think, you know, one of the first steps is really to review and understand what the context is in your country. So understanding risk analyses, identifying some of the tar target populations, the catchments that are of high risk potentially, um, the behaviors, and maybe even some of those key zoonotic pathogens. So really focusing on the analyses part could be a very good, a very strong starting point to understanding where you can strengthen time to detection. Similarly, um, we think that, you know, we discovered that multisectoral tabletop simulations or full-scale drills are really great system or, or systems mapping approaches are ways to identify uh, capacity gaps and system vulnerabilities. And this is a way to test the system, see how it's working and where you might need to adjust your existing plan if it, if it exists. Um, as I said, so if a plan exists, you wanna understand where those gaps are identified, how the, the simulation may result in new approaches and changes, and then moving to really taking that to an operational level. Is the information correct? You know, is the right, is the, are the right case definitions in that preparedness plan? Um, you know, are, are, is the plan costed and resourced? And then it's a great opportunity to adapt that plan. So if we follow this again during a peacetime scenario, you've done your simulation, you've identified where there are gaps, it's a, a good opportunity to adjust the preparedness plan to whatever the local protocol is. And it could be one that is all hazards or that encompasses you know, public health events of, of, of um, initially unknown etiology. Um, and then, you know, really supporting when, it, when there is that sort of um, need for uh, strengthening uh, identification and detection, how can you leverage your resources across the network that you've established as a One Health Bangladesh to support IPC at the facility level and biosecurity at markets? Um, knowing where your risks are, you know, how, which communities do you need to engage and who are the, the key actors and champions in those communities who can help, you know, message and, 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 and engage during an actual outbreak. And this is through, you know, community health workers or community animal health workers so that they are an extension of their surveillance mechanism that you have. Um, and this, I think, really does strengthen the, the diagnostic capacity and then the sampling capacity. So what are those needs in, in, in capacity gaps for, for, um, for, capac uh, for uh, sampling and diagnostics? And then really focusing on targeted training um, and, and working with rapid response teams. Um, if you have an AOC in your country, and most of them do, um, it's an opportunity to you know, make sure that if you've tested your plan, who are, who are the folks on that rapid response team? How do you activate? Um, and how do you, you know, how do you mount an, an actual response? But we know that, um, and I like this quote, uh, in pre preparing for, for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And I think this resonates well, because here we are in the US where, um, you know, don't, don't do as we do, but do as we say, right? I mean, we, we are really struggling with the COVID scenario here and have the high, you know, we have only about 5% of the world's population, yet 25% of the world's cases right now. And while we had some really excellent plans, um, we, we weren't really doing a lot around planning. And so I think, what are, we, what are some of the pitfalls of, of planning? You know, most of these preparedness plans that I've worked with and, and evaluated in these 16 countries, they tend to fall pretty short of, of what, where we're trying to get to. And why is that? Well, most plans tend to, to fail because they're often too long or really out of date. Um, you know, they're left on a shelf. They may be really unrealistic. Um, or, or not have the, the right um, information and no longer be relevant, not have the right case definitions. And, and then there's a, lot, a, a serious lack of training often where um, you know, you, if, if, if the plan has just been sitting on a, on a shelf, it hasn't had the chance to really be tested. So most plans end up being a plan to really have a plan. Um, and I think what we found in, in preparedness and response project was that you know, countries did have um, many interesting uh, uh, and, and meaty, very thick, dense uh, preparedness plans, but they weren't actionable. They weren't really operational. And so what we've, what we've tried to do is really look at how do you make plans operational and costed? And, and this goes beyond just the, the sake of having a plan. It's really about using a sort of reality-based kind of approach and understanding what are the specific resources you have right now 
you know, who are the people on the ground who would be the first responders? Who is your roster of rapid response team? Um, you know, who are the people and, and, and really creating just that very simple phone tree, um, which, you know, in many countries, they don't, they didn't even have that. So, and there are some challenges and barriers, you know, many people are not familiar with the sort of term and, uh, and understanding around operationalizing a plan. And there may not be in, in a country some relevant models to follow, or um, there haven't been examples of when that's been, been useful. We also know that operational plans, because they are not a static document, they, are, they require frequent, frequent updating. Um, and, and updating them is, is a great way to do that through a simulation or scenario-based uh, planning exercise. And the best part I think about holding about an operational plan is that it really does help for accountability. It keeps people, you know, understanding who is, is leading, which ministry has the right sort of, you know, when there's a trigger because there's a disease event, who is going on that disease investigation. Um, you know, once it's declared, uh, you know, and, and detected, who then goes and follows up and does the contact tracing, you know, how does that, how does that work? And, and because you've built these relationships already, um, it, it creates this, um, oh, I think that was a duplicate slide there. Um, it does create a better way of having sort of vertical coordination and, and communication in your country. So you have, you know, a sector that is, is getting information coming from the, you know, right from the local level all the way up to the national level, and then, and then horizontally across different ministries, which again is, is a critical component to, you know, really institutionalizing this One Health approach for outbreak response. So I know I spoke really quickly because it's quite late here, but the summary that I would say is, you know, relationships are key. Joanna mentioned the, the, the different levels of relationships in her presentation. You can't be successful if you haven't built the foundation on these relationships. And I think, you know, the, the idea of, of One Health convening different stakeholders is really about, you know, building those relationships. Um, the process to planning, it really needs to be flexible and adaptable. Um, I think you can take a really, you know, the gold standard plans, and we have them here in the U.S., um, and yet at the same time, those, those gold standard plans, we have, you know, they were not operational. They, were, they, they did not activate in a way that, you know, reduced um, the disease event and mitigated risk. Um, you know, into inputs really need to be reality-based and implementable. And we want to understand where there are redundancies or really irrelevant material that should be eliminated from these plans, keeping them really operational, really focused, and providing ongoing continual training and updates to the plans as they are needed. So where can you get some resources to do this? So there are a number of resources that are publicly available. The Tripartite Zoonosis Guide is one that's, um, I think, came out about a year ago and has gotten a lot of traction. There, and, and it's extremely comprehensive. Um, there is the USAID Preparedness and Response Planning Toolkit that I worked on, and it, that is also um, very uh, exhaustive. It's about 180 pages, and it's meant to use specific modules that you need for your country. Um, then there's uh, another guide that was developed during the avian influenza days that's still very relevant and is actually being used now in Latin America with some of the PAHO um, uh, member states, and that's leadership during a pandemic. And it's really about municipal level response and working with the communities, which I think is an extremely um, important part of, of the response. Um, and then I would just mention the sort of joint risk assessment that's part of the tripartite group that I think is really important to understanding where um, specific risks may lie. So that is all I have. Um, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to talk. I know I spoke fairly fast, um, but I appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nitish. Thank you very much for all this excellent presentation and having the global as well as uh, regional experience on the One Health capacity building, particularly coordination and institutionalization. Thank you very much. Now I will request uh, Dr. Selimud Jaman uh, to share his experience in the context of Bangladesh, One Health Capacity Building. Dr. Shanmu John, please. Uh, uh, good morning, Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, and good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, we can hear thank you. you. Uh, I guess you can see my slides as well. Yes. Okay. So, uh, to start with, 
we know that uh, this zoonotic infectious disease has been there for more than 10,000 years, but still it took a lot of time for the global population to understand that. We also know that 75% of the newly emerging infectious disease are zoonotic in origin. Thereby, you have many, many epidemics and pandemics uh, uh, in the globe for many hundred years ago. Like uh, uh, 100 years back, we had influenza. Another 100 years back, we had cholera. And another 100 back, we uh, had plague. So I will not go into all details 100 years back and back. But every 100 years, nobody lives to tell the story next person 100 years later. That's why we easily forget what happened last hundred years back and what we should have learned and what we should have done. So in recent past, if we talk about this uh, pandemics and epidemics, we can see H1N1 pandemic uh, in 2009. We can see global uh, Ebola hemorrhagic fever disease in 2014-15 in West Africa. And now we are going through COVID-19. And you can understand that uh, the uh, influenza pandemic started in Mexico in April. And in August, uh, one year later, it was over. Uh, Ebola was quick to handle. That was easy because it was not a global one. But this one, the global pandemic of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is totally a mess and it has gone beyond our capacity. We couldn't realize that how bigger a pandemic can be. But in Bangladesh, realizing this importance, we are doing something and that is what I will discuss. We understand that one health uh, key areas of capacity building are development of adequate science-based risk management policy, of course, skilled accredited veterinary and public diagnostic laboratories, and we should improve the use of existing natural resource and uh, maybe those resources will be limited, but still we have to have a good uh, using a technique uh, and policy for using this resource and thereby implementation. Bangladesh is unique in many ways. You know, Bangladesh is densely populated. We are hotspots for emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. We are very close to our animals and you can see people like it. And even in countries we are but the present is something uh, like laptop or mobile phone in Bangladesh, it is goat or hen in the villages. And we have very uh, bo uh, booming uh, farming business and poultry business. Uh, there are uh, challenges of climate change uh, in the uh, southern part of Bangladesh. And moreover, we have uh, many uh, zoonotic disease, especially like Nipah and trucks in our country. Realizing this, uh, the experts of Bangladesh who are working scatteredly in the field of One Health, they uh, understood that if we think about uh, uh, diagnosing a zoonotic disease, both cost, cost effective and to prevent in human, we have to work together. Otherwise, if there is exposure and there is a clinical feature in animals and later the animals are infect, uh, infecting the human, the humans have clinical feature and thereby the humans are going to uh, the doctor for uh, treatment. But when we know this in the uh, what total cost and delays uh, our outbreak investigation. Uh, so in Bangladesh, uh, since 2007, some champions of One Health Bangladesh, and you know many of them like Professor Nitish, Professor Mahmoud Rahman, they're working in this field. They realized in uh, Chittagong Sivasu University since 2007 that we need a platform who will think talk and uh, uh, work on one, one health activities in Bangladesh. And thereby, the first document they, we, they developed was the National Event Influenza and Human Pandemic Influenza Prepared and Response Plan. Later on, and subsequently every two years, since 2008, we have One Health Conference where we bring all the experts from uh, livestock, public health, the wildlife, and extended One Health Bangladesh so that we can have something in common to talk about and make a strategy in future. And in 2012, we developed One Health Strategic Framework to, how, uh, to let people know a document that how we will work in collaboration and coordination. You have already heard that multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration is a great challenge. It's very difficult to do. And that is why we started in 2012 to have a document so that we can talk the same language. In 2014, you already heard from Joanna that we had MPH and 
MBH, One Health and Biosecurity course, and that was very effective. We had people representing One Health, uh, like from public health, from wildlife, and from livestock as well. Later on, in 2012, uh, after 14 and uh, 2014 and 15, we have a, a joint project that was called a Baljack project. This is behavioral adaptation in live poultry and the people who are doing this poultry farming. And this was by, with the Royal Veterinary College and there were multi-stakeholders like Sivasu, IDCR and other partners as well. In 2016, uh, IDCR realized that we need people who are expert and trained in field epidemiology. That's why uh, the then Professor Mahmoud Rahman, who was uh, heading the IDCR, he started discussion with USCDC and we developed a global disease detection center in uh, Bangladesh and thereby we had this uh, field epidemiology training program uh, which also said MSc in applied epidemiology at IDCR. Uh, it made a difference. You can see how the FETPs made a difference in 2020 COVID-19 response. I will talk about this a little more later. In 2016-17, uh, also the veterinary sector in Sivasu realized that they need one health uh, institute. And also the talk about establishing an institutionalization of one health secretariat was started in 2016. And in 2017, there was a steering committee in the Ministry of Health. Uh, it was headed by Secretary of Health and uh, the participants were from all relevant and extended uh, ministries as well. And the development partners were also there. And the One Health Institute in Sivasu also started uh, recruiting uh, multi-sectoral students for their One Health Institute. In 2018, there was a, a, the second uh, revise, revised version of a strategic framework and action plan on One Health approach uh, that came into being. And we realized that, uh, as uh, Robert was saying, that time to time we have to revise our uh, you know, uh, documents so that people are awake and people should understand that now it's, uh, it's something new to do because we have people change. We need people to work together again so we can be on same uh, you know uh, platform. And at that time, we also started working with Cambridge University in UK on non-communicable disease as well. Because in Bangladesh, we realized that One Health is not only communicable disease, it is beyond that. So non-communicable disease should come into being as well. It's a fellowship program. And in 2019, uh, uh, Bangladesh started developing the document that was called Next Action, Action Plan for Health Security. And interestingly, we put all the stakeholders of One Health and One Health uh, uh, you know, non-engaged sectors, so that so that they have dedicated uh, you know policy planning and fund, uh, and uh, they they had a, a, a you know target to reach, and we wanted this to uh, you know uh, uh, incorporate our, in our national budget, so that each year we don't have to look for budget from national or international bodies. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 started in uh, 2020 uh, from uh, 2019. So uh, this thing uh, got, you know, delayed. So maybe by time uh, COVID-19 is done, we will be done with our document and we will try to incorporate in our future budget as well. But this document speaks of what we are doing now. Exactly these things came up from the minds of people who are thinking and eating one health. So that is why this is a live document, living document, and it can be uh, very useful to future generation as well. And now it is uh, 2020. We all talk about is uh, coronavirus. We think coronavirus. We even dream coronavirus. And in Bangladesh, the uh, campus of uh, you know this One Health Group. Uh, has made a real difference in outbreak investigation and surveillance of COVID response. And eventually these all activities is contributing a great to One Health capacity in Bangladesh. IDCR was first to realize in 27 and 2008 that something has to be uh, done about this One Health approach. And that is why not only IDCR thought of a bigger space to work with all sectors together so that we can accommodate the One Health Secretariat, which is already uh, placed in IDCR. And we also wanted uh, our development partners to be 
uh, working together in IDCR so that uh, uh, as we have uh, challenges of multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration, that can be taken care. So in IDCR, especially, we have workforce development focusing on FETBs, Impact Distinguished Fellows Program, and Capable, as I have already said. And these FETBs uh, advance work to rapid response team nationally, districtly, and in the Upazila. So we have a bottom-up approach and some participation so that we can reach them and we can uh, solve the problem understanding their uh, you know, difficulties. Impact and Distinguished Fellowship Program is uh, though a, a platform for the health system uh, development uh, strengthening, but uh, we have uh, you know uh, thoughts that in future maybe people from other sectors will be included as well because somewhere you have to start. Otherwise, uh, if you delay for having all sectors, it takes time. And capable is uh, gone beyond. It is not only the public health sector from the government only for uh, public health and uh, animal health, but it has gone beyond to the private sector as well, private uh, universities as well. So gradually understanding the strength of workforce development in one health sector. Uh, IDCR and government of Bangladesh in, is contributing day and day, and it is uh, you know, strengthening itself. We understand that for FETBs, we need a competency in assessing disease burden, outbreak investigation, disease surveillance, control prevention, uh, emergency preparedness, data management, reporting system, and we add leadership and risk communication. We see our FETBs as future head of the uh, respective institutes or departments. And we think if they are more organized, they can contribute more. Uh, One Health Institute is uh, in Sivasu, Chitong University, uh, Veterinary and Animal Science University. It started in 2017-18. They gave masters in public health. Already two batches have graduated. And they work in uh, collaboration with Bangladesh Institute of uh, tropical and infectious disease and Chittagong Medical College uh, together. Uh, for we also have FETP veterinary section in Bangladesh. They have just uh, you know taken uh, on the runway. They are about to take off, and we understand that you know there are many uh, veterinary problems which need concentrated uh, veterinary efforts to control it, like uh, you know uh, avian influenza and also lumpy disease in the animal sector. So they give uh, support to the veterinary sector through epidemiological service, population health service, and of course, health approach working together with human, animal, and ecosystem. There is also one strong collaboration work with UK Research and Innovation with Sivasu and IDCR, which is called One Health Poultry Hub. It started in March 2019. It's about uh, in Asian countries, uh, we address global demand for chicken meat and eggs, and the challenge to meet safe and sustainable way and ensuring biosecurity. It's actually focused in Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. It works to look after increased disease risk of people and chicken, and it contributes to policy analysis and programmatic, adaptable, and innovative intervention. This is a new program. It's a little challenging during COVID-19, but we have not lagging behind to work together in this field. So in Bangladesh, whenever we think of any outbreak investigation, uh, a team, or we think of uh, doing surveillance uh, somewhere, we think of a multidisciplinary one health approach. That is, there will be epidemiologists from veterinary and public health sector, clinicians, wildlife experts, veterinary anthropologists, ecologists, and they work together so that when we reach the uh, place, uh, we will understand that we can work together and there will be no you know, uh, challenges. I will give you one example. There was an outbreak of a crow death in Russia Medical College Hospital. So a one health team started from Dhaka to Russia. When they reached there, uh, they wanted to know about the crow and where the crows are living and eating and how it is, they are dying. But interestingly, we found that the crow belongs to the wildlife department. So we had to have somebody from wildlife. When we went to the places where the crows are eating, there we found that that area belongs to uh, LGRD, by local uh, uh, government department. So we have to have people from local government department as well. So likewise, 
we understand that one health is not only sometimes uh, veterinary section public health or wildlife it has to go beyond as well this is uh, something i'm sharing about uh, I, I, we are very proud of this, this that we have a one health secretary we, you already know this is a steering committee meeting headed by health secretary it goes round every 3 years the secretary of other uh, the ministry like uh, livestock and fisheries then forestry and environment they change and they head the you know steering committee and uh, it's uh, uh, you know we, that is why we have dedicated fund from ministry of health for one health secretariat and it is also a institutional one health secretariat which is right now residing in idcr uh, this one is our uh, global health security uh, 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 you know agenda uh, joint external evaluation program we were uh, it was done in 2016 17 and then uh, national action plan started last year uh, we are almost done except our financial planning hopefully if that can be done uh, we will have a organized framework how we can develop our uh, one health capacity to address any pandemic not only now in future as well uh, for coronavirus our uh, FETPs and other sectors uh, in the One Health are working together as well. Maybe all sectors are not uh, where they are working, especially in lab diagnosis. We have seen that our, uh, you know, public health sector and uh, animal health sector are working together. They have, you know, facilities for diagnosis of coronavirus, so they have come up with the ideas and facilities. And also this webinar of One Health. If you have uh, people uh, who are expert policymaker and planner attending this, so they are hearing you and people working abroad how they are handling this COVID-19. So they take uh, you know uh, all the notes from here. So then we can have a, a working committee at the national level together, which is national advisory committee, national technical committee, so that we can have uh, effective control measures for our COVID-19. And uh, uh, we also uh, work together in the field of awareness and risk communication uh, in the One Health approach. So this is uh, almost uh, all about uh, our capacity building in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much for your patience hearing. Thank you, Dr. Salim. I think uh, you have rightly uh, presented what is happening in Bangladesh with One Health capacity building. And thank you. This is a very good reflection of our uh, country uh, practices. And now I will go to a question and answer. Uh, there is one particular question, which is a very interesting, but also a little bit challenging. And it is uh, common to all three speakers. The question is, Bangladesh had almost all elements, including field epidemiology codes and on the NIPA, had good collaboration among all partners. And above all, you know, there is a very vibrant One Health community. Still, it looks so far, you know, well, we are not at the end, we're just perhaps at the beginning. Uh, with COVID-19, we have not done very well. Uh, can you give some reflection uh, about the inherent weakness of uh, One Health? Uh, in terms of embarking on such a, uh, you know, uh, global as well as national crisis. What could we have done better? Uh, I will start with Joanna. You know, you know Bangladesh, and maybe with your experience globally, is it only in Bangladesh? And I would say it is maybe uh, <laughs> it's a global scenario. And we have been talking about One Health for last, well, you can say it is for last three decades. What do, you, what do you think and about uh, uh, this scenario of the present world? Yeah, thank you, Natish, and also uh, Dr. Fayez, who asked the question. Yes. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about this myself. Uh, you know, we've, uh, there's been huge amounts of work have gone into, already into capacity building and FETP and FETPV and the, one Health Fellowships and University Networks. Um, um, uh, so, I, I mean, I think COVID has, <clears throat> has taken people by surprise. I don't think we ever believed we would have such a serious um, pandemic. 
And so people kind of haven't got their heads around the fact that this is a serious pandemic and it needs a serious response. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you look around the world as to what countries have been successful and, and what countries haven't been successful. And, and it's quite surprising seeing a number of the countries that have not had, uh, that haven't been successful. Um, uh, and, and, and a lot of that comes to, you know, there's politics and leadership and um, I mean, a number of things that are out of our control. Um, but looking at, you know, what, what preparedness and what training and capacity building we've, had, we've, we've been working on and surveillance systems, I've been sort of trying to think, you know, how, how could we do this better is to try and preempt a similar scale outbreak of the future? And um, I mean, I guess that was the basis of my presentation, but I, I think, you know, in, um, in a number of countries, and this question is particularly relating to Bangladesh, I guess an area where we could do better in the future is building leadership teams. I mean, I think a lot of effort goes in at the technical sort of, um, uh, you know, disease skills, outbreak investigation level, but um, not so much goes into the leadership. I mean, Robert referred to the document from PAHO, but, you know, I think really targeting leadership is an area that we could put more emphasis on in the future. Um, you know, leadership, uh, that, that brings together the like senior government leadership with the senior disease experts. Um, that there's uh, that those teams um, they practice they practice this sort of thing they practice scenarios they practice some um, responses <clears throat> as, as Robert was explaining that people understand roles that they get the feeling that this is a real thing that can happen and I just get you know a lot of people sort of seem to have responded or a lot of countries seem to have responded in a way that this isn't a real thing and we you know that we don't and so by the time they wake up that it is a real thing it's too late so I think so my response is putting emphasis into leadership teams and building stronger leadership um, that uh, has practiced scenarios has some understanding of roles that's built some relationships you know, that um, from the sort of top levels down through to the uh, hospital and, and laboratory level. Rob? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I actually, um, Prof Nitish, I was with you in IEBCR uh, in January when the, uh, I think there was one of the first cases that came in in COVID and got to see the sort of leadership happening within IEBCR. Uh, which was extremely impressive and great to see how quickly you mobilized. I mean, I think there are a couple things um, that come to mind and, and I think leadership is, as Joanna said, is, is critical. And, you know, from my country, we have, um, you know, really weak um, leadership at the, at the presidential level, which I think has um, caused a lot of chaos and panic um, probably, but we've had really strong governors and really strong mayors at the local level. And I think that's really key is having, you know, municipal leaders, community leaders really engaged in understanding, um, you know, what, what could be, what could become of a, of a major public health event. Um, the other thing I would say too is, you know, this, this particular, um, you know, coronavirus is, is so novel and, and the transmissibility of it was so unknown and, and still evolving, in fact, when, when people were mounting their response. So I think, you know, did people um, take it seriously globally? I don't know. I mean, I think people were really taken, like you said, taken by surprise by the, the level of, um, of uh, infectiousness of this, of this disease. So I, I would say, of this virus rather. So I would say, um, you know, it really does come down for me to leadership and um, yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know, I can't speak specifically to, to, uh, to Bangladesh as much, but I think, you know, I, I was there, as I said, for the, one of the first cases, and it was really impressive to see how well people mobilized. Um, but you don't know, you don't know what the disease transmiss transmissibility is at that time, you know, and like, you, that's a big problem. I think PPE is another major problem. And like, the disruption of supply chains could be uh, uh, you know, a challenge to getting people uh, the right tools that they need to to be safe and to to prevent infection. Over. Yes. This is a very good response, but 
uh, just a supplementary, you know. This is what is the One Health uh, learning, you know, uh, that a lot of unpredictable things will happen. And that is what the epidemiologist, One Health expert have been talking about over the last two decades. Uh, I mean, this is an unknown thing will happen. We do not know what will happen. And, uh, and then the preparation should have been like that. We can really face this sort of situation. Uh, is it not that the, it is also a sort of failure of understanding of One Health community globally? What do you think? Well, I mean, I, th I think that there's, I don't mean any, um, anything bad by this, but I think the One Health community is really good at talking to the One Health community. Um, I think we, we as, as One Health practitioners have to talk outside of our, of our own circle and get people to understand um, why this is so important and, and, you know, what the risks are for spillover events and how, you know, novel pathogens and viruses can spread in ways that we, we don't really know. Um, so I think, you know, One Health is a, is a catalyst for bringing people together for planning and preparedness and response. But we have to do a better job as practitioners to inform the general public ab about what, what it is we're doing and why we see the value in it. So can I add? Yeah, Dr. Selim, please. Yes. So uh, I think uh, leadership is like this, even if you have another one after 100 years, because they will be concerned with economic. So we don't uh, really should think about this and, uh, you know, pulling them down. They will act like this all over the country and uh, all over the globe. And it should be accepted because their worry is it to ensure to feed everyone in the country. But what was lacking was even Bangladesh had all the components of One Health. Uh, we did not, or I think we don't understand engaging, engage, engaging people who are beyond this One Health. So there are partners who are non-engaged and we should bring them into the same platform. And then my, my third point is One Health is not a country something. It has to be beyond that regionally and globally. We fail to communicate properly through One Health approach regionally and globally. That is why we are right now where we are, we are now. Thank you. Joanna? Do you want to add something on that? So I think uh, one health, could, you could, <clears throat> I mean, I guess, so now we have a, a, a basically a human health disease given following a spillover, a human health pan pandemic. Um, I mean, one health can particularly work well in the earlier stages of detection and, and um, understanding the sources, but given we have uh, a huge pandemic on our hands, then, um, I mean, it's been very challenging in New Zealand, for example, that, uh, um, you know, our Ministry of Health and its natural the Ministries of Health lead the response, but they haven't been, um, there's no um, engagement or very little engagement on the animal health side. And yet the animal health side has a lot of experience in managing outbreaks. Um, and in preparedness and, and in practicing and being prepared. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so we've been effective um, in applying One Health in particular areas, but it's not uh, kind of accepted as, as, as standard practice, I guess, when it's applied to uh, diseases and, and, um, uh, and uh, you know, I guess in an outbreak of the scale, you know, the, the important thing is to bring in all resources, bring in all the sort of expertise and resources and, you know, where a One Health um, approach really could plan, could um, benefit. And I, I guess that's, um, so it comes back to having, building relationships, having relationships in place and, and One Health sort of working uh, one health kind of work. I mean, I think in, you know, in Bangladesh, where you've been really, really successful, is that you you have strong One Health leadership and strong relationships, and that's not the case in all countries. Um, and that uh, I guess through um, One Health activities pre-pandemics, that you can build up those relationships that can then be 
drawn on to help manage a response. Yeah, I will go with another question to all of you. You know, uh, in terms of the prioritization, uh, the experience that you have gathered in working on One Health, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you really recommend something uh, in addition to what we have been doing as a priority work for the One Health community? I'll start with Rob, you know. Uh, what do you think about uh, the prioritization uh, of One Health uh, activities? What should be their priority, either in the country level or at the regional level, maybe even in the global level? What do you think? Oh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I think, whew, I would say at a global level, one health, um, and Joanna said this too, I mean, it's, it's only in an, in an, in an outbreak scenario, it's, it's useful up until the point you know, when, you, when, you've, when you've detected the, the virus and you know what the specific pathogen is and it's an animal disease and then you mount your response. If it's an, you know, an animal, a human health issue, it, you know, the, the, the human health um, uh, mounts the effort. I mean, I think I, I think there's a lot of task shifting that can be shared, infrastructure that can be shared in these types of in, in these types of uh, these types of outbreaks. So you know, there are really strong veterinary laboratories um, that could be useful. Um, and and I so I, I think getting people to understand what One Health can do and how you know if you're cross training together and you're developing these linkages and relationships from you know, your academic careers in, in medicine and in human medicine and in veterinary medicine, and you're coming together to train, it becomes almost as going back to relationships, it becomes almost like, you know, you can call up your friend and you can say, you know, here are the opportunities and, and, and you know, the things that we can do to help in this situation. I think globally, we have to do um, a better job talking about One Health outside of the One Health community. Um, and I've been, I've been saying that for a long time. And I think the other thing we have to really do is figure out how to demonstrate the effectiveness of One Health better. Um, and, and getting that to, I think probably to um, Dr. Salim's point, really about um, what are the economics of One Health? Like what, what, what is the value addition to this approach? Um, and how can you leverage these these um, synergies for for more efficiencies and better economies of scale over Salim. and mute you are still mute sir thank you this is a million dollar question uh, <laughs> you're right uh, we have to understand uh, that still now Perhaps only the scientific world of One Health is more connected, but we are yet to bring people, I'm again saying, who are non-engaged, but who influence our policy and planning. They're not only regional level or uh, you know, local level, it has to be in global level as well. If they don't understand, you cannot bring people working together. It will always remain a challenge. If I understand in my country that NEPA is a problem, it can be anywhere in the globe. That's not enough. My leadership has to understand and other country leadership also has to understand this. So I think that challenge has to be taken care. Otherwise, uh, we will remain talking and waiting another 100 years for another huge global pandemic. Thank you. Joanna? So, <clears throat> yeah, it's a big question. <clears throat> Uh, so prior to this event, I mean, the, the One Health uh, community rightfully, I mean, has been very focused on emerging infectious diseases. And, um, and, and I think the areas that we've particularly focused on are surveillance you know, and, and, um, uh, and, and then outbreak investigation, um, response and planning you know, through the PNR program. But I think one of the things that, um, and you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, I guess that an area that we probably need to do better in is practicing responses. Like um, <clears throat> doing more, uh, you know, doing more scenario-based work. Um, 
you know, when you know you look at the military and they 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 do exercises, you know, every year uh, in preparation. I mean, it really, the the for in the health area, we have to be doing the same thing. That you know, <clears throat> every one or two years, there's got to be practice events of um, practicing for a scenario. So I think, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I think this is an area that we could do 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 better in is. Um, not only improving our detection, um, improving our outbreak. I mean, even outbreak investigation. <clears throat> People know the you know the one, two, three, four, five that you do for an outbreak investigation. But there's so many things around um, that affect, influence whether something's reported, whether it's done, whether an investigation is done. You know, resources, motor cars, fuel, um, motivation, all sorts of things. Um, and a lot of those are outside of our control, uh, direct control. Um, so my answer is that if we given more stronger priority to uh, sort of scenario-based training, practicing response, practicing working together, um, and identifying uh, uh, you know gaps and how how we could do this better in the future. Yes, uh, Rob, do you want to say something? Yeah, one thing I would say too is just, I think, and this is, I'm seeing this now more with, with the COVID scenario is engaging the private sector. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot that the private sector can do um, in, in terms of the preparedness side and, and also in response. And, and, and I'm even, even in Bangladesh, we're seeing, you know, opportunities and in, in investments with, with the private sector around PPE production and mask, you know, development and distribution. But what about telecom and, and you know, what about, um, you know, communications, of course, telecommunications, uh, transportation. I mean, there's a lot that can be done with the private sector um, on the response side that I think we, we haven't even really tapped yet. What about, you know, there is a one question here I would like to put in a different way. What about the future generation, you know, uh, that uh, we are building in a very traditional way? Uh, but the world has changed, as you can see, with the COVID-19. Uh, whatever you do, everything has gone. And we have invested quite a lot of money on One Health, either from the development partners or even sometimes from the government as well. Uh, but have we really focused much on capacity building for the future generation? What do you think, uh, Dr. Selimud Jawan? I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, indeed. And as I said earlier, that uh, we in engage uh, other partners, that is One Health Beyond, non-engaged partners. And in Bangladesh, uh, during this COVID-19, we have engaged our IT sector, our telecommunication, and other sectors like this who can contribute. Uh, they are giving us, uh, you know, a different uh, risk communication message through their mobiles. When you ring somebody, you can hear this in Bangladesh. They are talking about something on COVID. We have, uh, you know. Uh, corporate sectors who have uh, social responsibility, they are putting on ad on the TV for hand washing and for uh, mask wearing. We have uh, print media who are, uh, you know, having talk shows and, uh, you know, uh, solving uh, uh, immediate short medical problems through, uh, you know, on, uh, 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 you know, live channels from uh, print and uh, mass communication. So we have, and we are trying to engage those things, uh, sectors. But I think we need more uh, sectors to be engaged. I agree with this. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, like maybe perhaps uh, uh, doing uh, better because we have people who understand One Health better than in many countries. That's why we quickly engage these sectors. And not only that, uh, the military was uh, with uh, this, uh, you know, uh, approach since uh, the first, uh, when we had first batch of uh, people coming from Wuhan. And you know, our quarantine section, we had a joint uh, collaborative effort from uh, private, from public, and from uh, military as well. So we are on, on the right track. But uh, you know, it takes time for people who plan it, who put money on this, who put fund on this, a little more time. Be frustrated that things are not happening as you are thinking very fast. Oh, you, you are mute. Salimun Jaman, you are muted. 
Yeah, you can hear, I can hear you now. I can hear you now, yeah. So yeah, you, whatever I said you missed, right? Yeah, a little bit. I was talking, did I don't know which part you didn't hear. I said that, yes, we have engaged uh, our partners who are beyond One Health, or we the, those uh, the sectors we define as One Health. That is, our IT sector is with us. Our yeah, yeah, we are there. Mass media yeah. is with us. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Rob, do you want to make a comment on that? No. Uh, uh, Mackenzie. So how can we better prepare our future generation um, <clears throat> of, of One Health professionals? <clears throat> well, I think um, as was the case after avian influenza, you know, first the um, uh, H5N1 outbreaks, you know, there was a lot of resource went into um, uh, upskilling vet uh, veterinarians um, and, and the strong focus on One Health. Um, at that stage. And I think the same again is going to happen now after COVID. <clears throat> and so we have to use these opportunities, I guess, when there, when there is a, um, a disease outbreak that we, or pandemic that we, um, where there is resource made available, that we use this as well as we can to, to I guess, build a cadre of, of, um, <clears throat> of, of One Health professionals, of um, so our veterinary schools and med schools tend to graduate clinicians, <clears throat> and it's really in postgraduate, you know, um, training or public health or veterinary public health, <clears throat> uh, where there's the opportunity to build up sort of disease management um, skills and, and, and epidemiology and um, and you know su surveillance and investigation and, and disease control. So. Um, I, I think really using the resource to um, to, to implement more uh, programs that bring the human health, animal health, wildlife health sectors that are train them. I mean, I, I feel like the, the Massey model worked well where we had the um, sort of theoretical skills around epidemiology that were then applied in, um, in field investigations, but also in the scenario and policy. <clears throat> Uh, and a part of the problem was that, uh, that 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 those programs were really a drop in the bucket in terms of the number of people that were were built up. So it's always the cry, I guess, that more funding to <clears throat> to put into programs where uh, where doctors, vets, uh, wildlife uh, are trained together to understand the and build their skills for disease control, but also uh, bring them into a a context where they're applying them and as I said wh one of the things that I learn more and more as uh, life goes on is building relationships. Yeah um, w there is one question here I will put it in a, this way that uh, you know we did a lot of good work in terms of research hunting viruses you know and that has been going on you know but a lot of investment as well as active engagement but have we done much on the motivational side, human behavior change side uh, over the last, uh, uh, you know, two or three decades, when we started to talk that pandemic may come, more severe disease may come. Have we done much on this area? What do you think? This is the one comment we got. The human behavior change, motivation, uh, are all Uh, you're asking me. Um, I mean, I think <clears throat> I think there's uh, still a lot more we can do. I mean, part of it is understanding the incentives and drivers that move in 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 relate to behavior. I think um, we know, you know, spillover events happen um, sometimes in areas where you know humans and animals are interfacing more closely, and because of you know land use change, because of the way that we you know, we are as humans changing our environment. So I think it's it's a bigger question around, you know, how can we identify the right policy levers, the right sort of, you know, community um, based approaches that that under that understand the behaviors that are at risk and then, 
you know, create the, the levers and the incentives to, to change them. Um, it's not, I don't think that's an easy task at all. And it's definitely not a one size fits all approach in each country. I think it's a very, you know, it's very different to the context. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that's that's where I think we, we need to be going is looking at the human behavior, especially as you know incomes rise globally. That means that there's a, a greater likelihood of more um, you know protein based you know animal protein based food consumption. So that's that's in increasing the 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 risk of of more um, you know intensive livestock and animal production that can create more of these disease events. So I think we really have to think about our behaviors. Um, and, and, and how we can, you know, motivate to change. Yeah. William? Yeah, I will add with Robert. I will say if your income increases, you will look for exotic food as well. And that where your, uh, you know, challenge comes. You will go to China or Southeast Asia and start eating something you never saw it even before. So, you know, these is our challenges uh, globally that people look for something new. Uh, to make people understand, uh, to answer uh, Professor Nitish's earlier question as well. I think uh, during our residency course in our medical school or other related, uh, you know, animal health and wildlife school, we should have, a, you know, simulation exercises uh, that should be funded through the government program, not that you always look for uh, separate, uh, you know, donor agencies. And to make people aware, if you say that a pandemic is coming, they will not think, they say, I will not survive 100 years. Tell them, if pandemic comes, whatever you made, it will be gone and you'll be back to zero. I think they will listen to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, Joanna? You know, I think it's human nature. You know, when uh, you're uh, faced with a pandemic, people get, are aware and are concerned. Then you have nothing for 10 years and then people forget about it. Um, and, you know, resources are, are limited. And so uh, start to move resources away from preparing for pandemics to, you know, we've moved um, and a lot of resource recently has gone on to AML. I mean, there's lots of other health problems around and, uh, and this is one of them and it's, it's a major one at the moment. I mean, I think the countries that experienced SARS, they were in a better position to respond. They responded more appropriately and quickly um, they learned through that experience and uh, I hope that and I guess that we will learn through the experience of COVID-19 uh, and that will be a motivation for the next 10 years or so to really put effort into um, understanding how we can respond better. I think it's very difficult to get people to, to motivate people in the absence of a threat and it's a theoretical threat and uh, it's always kind of out there, but it's not not here. Um, so really, you know, um, experience um, having uh, having um, media and movies and, and things that kind of can make this real, bring it back to. But it's it's very difficult in the absence of a real real event uh, for people to take it seriously, and that I think that's part of what's been the problem with COVID is that. For some, you know, governments were taken, we were all taken by surprise at how, at the, at the impact of this disease and didn't respond uh, quickly enough. So how you actually get people to do that when it's not there, it's a really challenging thing. You know, the movie, the movie uh, Contagion, you know, I think that actually impacted quite a few people. They realised what sort of thing could happen? Um, you, you know, you don't. I, I guess you want to put things out there that keep, that keep people aware, but they don't sort of give them, um, scare them, or give them traumatic, traumatic. Um, Can I well. add something with Joanna, sir? Can I add with Joanna, sir? I think Dr. Nitish is, uh, you know, out of connection. He'll reconnect. I'll just add a few words with Joanna. Yes, the movie is wonderful. We have watched time and again, but that is a movie. People don't realize it. But what we realize that if you have the wise men around your leaders, make sure your wise men push this through to the leadership, that things work. Uh, unfortunately, we have many, many wise men that say, oh, he didn't listen to me. If they don't listen to you, don't be there. 
you put somebody to whom they listen. And of course, your wise man should understand as well what to say and what not to say. Because every uh, level, every sector has priority. Even if it is politics, they have priority. So you have to understand and talk in their language as well. So these understandings are, I think, missing. Uh, we knew that uh, COVID started in uh, December 2019 in China, perhaps uh, earlier in uh, seeing the articles. But it took us a long time through those wise men to make our leadership understand that you do something serious. This is my personal opinion. I don't know if you agree or not. I think uh, uh, Professor Nitish is not uh, there. Uh yeah, I think uh, Professor Nitish dropped so, from the connection. Norul, can you carry on? Norul, can you yes. carry on? So the last question, heard from, yeah, he's joining. Sorry, I, uh, I lost connection, you know, and uh, I have to use my uh, laptop. I think, uh, you know, we are at the end now. Uh, I will uh, ask the last question to all of you. Uh, Joanna, before you leave, there is one uh, whispering, you know, from different corners that uh, uh, there are presence of uh, COVID-19 virus in animal, particularly in pet. Very recently, there is one issue came up from India. There is a presence of uh, such coronavirus type 2 in goat. What is your comment? Uh, yes, there's certainly been um, SARS coronavirus found in cats, uh, dogs, um, tigers, um, and there's a, quite a serious uh, outbreak in, in the Netherlands with mink, where it's actually um, spreading, um, spreading between the mink, and I think there's some evidence of spread from mink back to people. Um, I, so I haven't actually followed uh, the, the research closely. I can't um, comment on, um, I can't comment in depth on how, um, uh, how serious an impact that, um, that an animal infection will have. But I, I think the mink situation has, is particularly worrying um, where there's, you know, you've got spread through the populations and, and back to people. Um, and so there might be something specific about the, that um, type of animal uh, that, that, that um, the, the disease is able to spread. I, I don't know in terms of cats and dogs, uh, I haven't done or followed the research to see how serious that is. And maybe someone else can comment. Yep. Well, uh, this is the last question and uh, we'll go to the end of this uh, session now. The last question, you know, with our present experience and whatever you have said throughout this uh, webinars, uh, we would like to ask you, what is your impression about the future of One Health? Is One Health going to survive? Is it going to be a weaker approach or it is going to be a stronger approach, uh, even stronger? I would start with McCarthy. I think it'll be stronger. Uh, um, <clears throat> I think there's a realization that that that, that the spillover, and, you know, um, the 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 risk of spillover from wildlife or into uh, and or other animals into people is is a real thing that can have huge huge uh, impacts on our global economy. So I think it'll strengthen um, one health. <clears throat> And, and really strengthens the, the, the need, I guess, for bringing together the, the, human, the, the wildlife health, the um, uh, animal health and human health teams together. And particularly in, uh, invest, you know, at the sort of early detection stage um, uh, and, and understanding sources, looking at risks for uh, transmission and spillover. So I would say that it's, uh, it's going to be stronger, and particularly in looking at spillover risks. Oh. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would say, you know, I think now people are talking about, you know, dinner time conversations are around, you know, epi curve and things that, you know, we would talk about, but not the, you know, the common general folk. So I think we are in a good place for One Health. I do worry a little bit about how sometimes it becomes 
you know, if it's not clearly defined or if it's too broadly defined, One Health could become everything and then therefore maybe lose some of its cachet. Um, so I think keeping it, um, you know, keeping it robust and vibrant and doing really good advocacy and really good, you know, publications that extend beyond the traditional animal and human, but also include more of the social sciences. I think there'll be a lot of PhD dissertations that come out of um, this, this particular COVID scenario. So I think we are on a good trajectory with One Health. Yeah, but you know, if you see the type of tie, uh, I do not see their visibility in this uh, present condition. I saw one of your slides. What is the type of tie globally? I cannot see them in this COVID situation. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't, I know that, that the tripartite is working very busy um, and, and uh, they're working very hard behind the scenes, but I think you're, you're right. Um, and probably because institutionally WHO is the, the sort of voice and, and face right now and as it's a human health um, issue. Um, but you're, you're right, that's a great question. It, it would be great to see more statements and act, active, uh, activities coming from them. The, the last thing I would say about One Health, though, is that, you know, the Global Health Security Agenda, which now has 65 countries that have signed on, I anticipate that will probably become a bigger, you know, a bigger player in this, in this world. Um, and, you know, foundational to the Global Health Security Agenda is the One Health approach. And so I think that really does bring the visibility that we need to, you know, this multi-sectoral coordination. Over. So thank you. Uh, just to add with John earlier about the animal, uh, you know, infection. In Netherlands, there are around dozen uh, farms where minks are infected, and they have, uh, you know, killed uh, thousands of mink. Uh, but we are yet to establish whether the infection went from mink to human or human to mink. If it is from mink to human, then you have another, uh, you know, like uh, you know, uh, secondary host which might be mink. Anyway, to answer to Professor Nitish. Uh, as Robert has already mentioned, uh, National Action Plan for Health Security is a major place where One Health can play an important role. But we have to remember, even this document and this understanding uh, of global community uh, it comes out and we agree with this. One Health will survive if we can go beyond One Health and engage the non-engaged partners as well. Otherwise, otherwise, the challenge will remain forever. Thank you. Can I Thank you. With this, uh, yes, Sorry. yes, please. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I think it, right, at, right at the moment, while we're just we're right in the throes of managing the pandemic and and trying to, you know, save lives, and and it's a human pandemic. So, I mean, One Health is not featuring strongly in how the pandemic itself is managed. So I think it's uh, I, I, it's probably not prominent in people's minds at the moment, but um, my feeling is that uh, as we get a bit further down the track and start to um, look at well, how did this happen and what can we do to prevent it in the future, that's when there'd be a stronger um, a stronger setting and environment for one health, for one health to um, play a key role. Thank you. I think it is quite an insightful, active, and very interactive webinar. And thank you so much to all these three speakers and participants. I know this is early morning for Bangladesh, and it is a weekend. People could not even wake up, but those who have attended uh, on behalf of One Health Bangladesh, I must thank you for participation. And Rob, I know it is a sleeping time for you, but we're sorry to give you this trouble, but you have given truly a very strong insight on this thing. Uh, uh, Salim Jaman, you have rightly presented Bangladesh, and Joanna, you are always lovely to Bangladesh people. You have been in touch with us, and we are today, and maybe we'll be listening to you in the future. With these few words, I will conclude uh, this uh, session today and maybe see you next time. Thank you very much for attending uh, this webinar. Bye bye. Thank you. So thank you and, and, and thank you, my learned uh, you know, uh, uh, panelists with me. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Have a good sleep. <laughs> uh, good